I have to confess I didn't uh, put a lot of thought into introducing our guest speaker tonight. Um, I suspect everyone in this room knows our guest speaker and I, it doesn't need much of an introduction. But at the last minute I thought, well, I better... So I, I googled him and I learned uh, what, <laughs> what he taught at UConn. He's a retired UConn professor, Avery Point, and he had a lot of expertise. He taught fiction and nonfiction, American nature writing. Um, Shakespeare, short stories, modern British novels, and journalism. And I don't see uh, uh, writing about the sea, but I think that was down there too. Um, so that's what he taught at, at Avery Point. Uh, in among the things on Google, I found that uh, the day said in 2017, midday, any day, you might find Steve hobnobbing at Carson's. <laughs> Palmer's Provisions wasn't open at that time, so now I'm not sure which one you're more likely to find in that, but um, yeah, it, that's probably still accurate. And then the reason we're all here tonight, or one of the main reasons, is what the residents said in 2014. They said Steve was known for telling a good story. Oh, oh Jesus. So, with no more ado, we will turn this over to Steve, who no doubt has a good story. Oh. Oh. Got my, my equipment here. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> Back there, okay, yeah. Well, you know, you know what Mark Twain said about an expert? I was just introduced as an expert. He says, an expert is any damn fool away from home. <laughs> Problem is, I'm not away from home. I can't get away with anything. <laughs> OK. Let's see. Could, when, when, when your time, I'll cue you. OK. All right, let's see. This is, this is one of my props. I'll get to that in a minute, this gnarly thing. It says here that uh, th these are going to be anecdotes. An anecdote, of course, is a short, short story. You see told just one of them at the beginning of a potentially extremely boring meeting. And it's supposed to be humorous in order to ingratiate the speaker with the audience. Hmm. There's a Monty Python thing that looks like what I'm doing now about how not to run a meeting that John Cleese said, oh, here it is. <laughs> we were going down the driveway and my wife says, are you going to take any notes or you're just going to have two hours on Tony Pesolese's shirt? We will have Tony Pesolese's shirt, but not to start with. Okay, now the problem with the anecdote, if you worked at a university, which as you mentioned I did, is because is it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nasty word. And, and the, the most devastating thing you can say about a person is that his material, his data is anecdotal. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you think about running <laughs> a, 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 I've, I've done one of these things occasionally about rum running, and uh, a guy asked me one time, he says, I have a question for you. How many cases of whiskey came in through Montauk to Mystic? That's the kind of thing you ought to know if you're an expert, right? And you think, well, how would, hi. I haven't seen you in a long time. How would you, how would you do, how would you assemble that data? You have a guy in the pier with a clipboard, right? Excuse me, sir, you're putting in the rumble seat there how many cases? And is that whiskey or is that gin? You only, the only guys on the data are the ones that get caught. And anybody can do that and get caught, so you don't tell stories about the guy that got caught. Except we have one on the cover here. This guy here, of, of your, your ledger, yeah, he apparently, I don't know that story at all, and, I, and a lot of you here I know have, have great stories. 
uh, you know, to tell about what your contact was here, or uncle or whoever got involved in this. Let, let me, t just to set things straight, tell you why we're here and what prohibition is. And the reason for, I feel the need to do that is because I was working with a seaport at one point with uh, uh, my film friend there, Bailey Pryor, and we were, we were <laughs> meeting for lunch with the president of the seaport at that time, and the curator was just a kid, it seemed to me, I'd just gone a long time ago. And we print made our presentation. We were going to have that whole funny new building they built, the one that looks like a wave. We were going to have that for a month or a week, something to, to do this. And so we made our presentation. And about 10 minutes into it, the curator says, what's prohibition? <laughs> and I thought, he is either one of two things. He's either very clever, and he wants to say, enough of that. You have to reach the people. And they don't necessarily know what prohibition is. So you should, I want to see if you can explain it to me. He could have been doing that, or <laughs> so <laughs> you know this guy. <laughs> so later on, about two or three weeks later, we were making another presentation in front of the, some of the elite staff, Quentin Snedeker and, and Paul, Paul Pecco and some of those guys. They all know the prayer. So we're up there, and I'm, I'm standing here, and, and Bailey's a big tall guy here, and the other guy's around the corner. So I start off again, and I get about <laughs> two sentences in, and what's prohibition? He asked it again, see. So I started to lean around Bailey and I said, you, you take this guy, right? And so he, he, he gave me that. So, all right, I feel now that I owe this guy what it is. And your editor here said on page one, some of you probably already read this, but I don't see you studying it right now, so I'll read it to you. Okay, you ready? Take notes, yes. On January 17th, 1920, that's a date you probably would forget, right? The 18th, 18th, Amendment went into effect for the next 13 years. And it was illegal to manufacture. I have a story later I'm going to tell. I, I, I let my mother off the hook because she wasn't merely manufacturing stuff. But I see, no, you can't do that either, Mom. You can't manufacture, sell, or transport liquor in the United States. During the Prohibition, Long Island Sound became a hotbed of illicit activity as rum runners sought to smuggle foreign booze into New York City. The people of, no Hank, you guys will love this, had a front seat. <laughs> had a front seat to the show. And then it says this, we're going to do this, he's going to do anecdotes. And then uh, the, the speaker for tonight is quoted, I think that's probably me. He said, anyway, anecdotes, because documentation is by nature hard to come by, in an did he really write this? He can't even read it. And really, in an illegal trade which thrived on poor enforcement. Okay, everybody now knows all you need to know about that. All right. Uh, prohibition in Noank. Let's consider a simple question here. The one that was asked to me before, the guy says, How many cases of whiskey were uh, taken in around Montauk to uh, Mystic or Noank? Let's, think of, let's use this as a heuristic tool, as we would say at the university. It's something we can learn by, not just call it a dumb question, right? And say, okay, how many cases? We already talked about the hypothetical tally man, you know, asking people how much stuff they were bringing in. Uh, well, let's think a little bit about Montauk. What does it mean to, to take it in from Montauk? Now, many of you here have been, I'm sure you have, yeah, to Montauk, and you go in that nice little harbor there, and the yacht club's right there, and is on the island, and so forth, and things. That wasn't opened up until 1923, and you're not going to land it out around the corner on the beach, because even on a calm day, you know, landing a small boat full of glass bottles, and they, oh my God. You wouldn't do that. You've got to get in the harbor, but you've got to wait until 1923, and then you come right in by the Coast Guard station. High, you know? <laughs> and the worst thing about it, if you think about the logistics, and so much of a rum running is the running part, which is you know, the logistics. Where are you going to take this stuff? To the little village of Montauk? Where there's a couple of fishermen there. None of the, the, the sport fishermen guys are in there now. You don't have the Harry Krishner commercial fleet in was there last time I was there. Uh, you don't have, a, you, very few people are there. And you got a long road, two concrete strips with a little tire in between and those, you know, all the way 100 miles to Manhattan. And those trucks that go 35 miles an hour, maybe. 
No, you're not going to do that. You've got to land it closer. Right? How about doing a port that's already established there, that's a little closer to New York and has a better road, Green Park. You're going to come into Green Park. And we'll get to Greenport here in a little minute because one of our, our heroes tonight has did a lot of work from Greenport. And that there's a connection between Greenport and Noank and Key West, which is more connection than you have between Noank and Hartford. Why would you go to Hartford? <laughs> I, say, I was born there, but you know, I, I escaped. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting question now, right? It, because it gets you thinking about what's really involved here. It's not all about machine guns and the it's about you know trucks and logistics and, and as if you were transporting anything. And those trucks that were basically uh, protos trucks, that's what they were already, as we would say today, online. And those were those, those trucks that had the, the canvas on the back like a big Conestoga wagon, right? And, and they were all run by the people who ran protos in those days, who were, there's a lot of ethnic stuff here, those were the Italians, they weren't necessarily all gangsters, they were guys in the protos business and they had the trucks. And as I said, those trucks would go 35 miles an hour, maybe, Whew, you know. Okay. Let's think, too, a little bit about what characterizes a good pro prohibition story. It seems to me it's a unique blend of uh, ostentatiousness and, and furtiveness. That is, showing off and uh, sneaky stuff. It's a kind of blend of that. And the idea is that somehow this is all a lot of fun. And that applies, of course, to the first part of prohibition, and as my father used to say, uh, it, it was no longer fun when the gangsters came in. And that wasn't the way it was to start with. My father had a schooner, which he kept down the street here, right back of Frank, on, on uh, it was called Freem Rogers Boatyard then. I finally figured out what that meant. His name was Freeman. I called him Freem, yeah. And he was right there where Mrs. Herring later was and other... <laughs> If you were at that meeting last night, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it's, 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 it's a very uh, hot spot, you might say, if you were quoting this stuff here. And his, he had this schooner that had the bowsprit that was hanging over the road because in those days it was enough of a sharp bank and you could get the stuff underneath it. And the reason I'm talking about that schooner is because it had its foremast shut off. How do you get your foremast shut off? <laughs> That's the first warning shot across the bow and a little bit tighter than you meant. Boom. It was called the Ramona originally. He called it the Seven Seas. He bought it for $800, 1932, and, and lived on it in Watch Hill when he was working as a carpenter on a roof job down there. And that's how actually my family came to Noank with that, that boat, that rum runner. Uh, did he run rum? Yes, but not on that boat. Not really. Well, anyway, let's. <laughs> I think the statute of limitations. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, we also th tend to think of, of rum running, I suppose, as a victimless crime. But but you know, let, let's 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 face the fact here that, that uh, alcoholism is not funny and it's not good. Something needs to be constantly done about it. It's just that prohibition probably wasn't the way to do that. And what it did is it educated a lot of people, like my father and a lot of his friends, into how not to drink. As we used to say, you go to college to learn how to drink. Uh, those people learned how not to drink, right? And when my father had his, his wedding anniversary, the 50th one, I think, he says, uh, they, they hired this Sabino and so forth, where the engine was made right over there, right? And uh, he said, one of the reasons we want to do that is because uh, those drunks, you know, they, 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 you, if you're on the Sabino, you get off the boat, everybody gets off the boat. When they're in your house, they're still there, right? <laughs> and my mother says, no, they've all died. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's my, that was my temperance speech. I don't drink myself, and neither did Bill McCoy, <laughs> oddly enough, which is why he was a success, because all his rivals were always half in the bag, and uh, that's not a good way to run a schooner, or, or most anything, right? Okay, let's, let's uh, go to an actual anecdote. Uh, my, I, I should identify my source. My source is a fellow named Tony Pezzolese. Some of you knew him. How many people here know him or the family? Yeah, great, great guy. When I bought the house across the street for $7,500, yes, his, da his daughter corrected me. He said, she paid nine for it. You did? Yeah, okay. We got in a bidding war with the DBS. He's got it up to 9000 Had to spend some more money so he could actually live in it. Uh, you know, <laughs> the birds were living in the chimney, live birds. Anyway, uh, 
Ken Vandenbury, a name I'll come back to here if we last long enough, uh, he, he said, well, he, he introduced me to the people next door, and he says, these are the Pace Lazies. And I thought, my God, this must be a, a, from, you know, Fisher's Island or the Pace Lazies or something. I don't know why he called him that. He knew better than that. He was very literate. But uh, this is a footnote coming up. Here's how you spell Pace Lazy. P-E-Z-Z-O-L-E-S-I. And he was number 327 at Electric Boat. This is his tag off his locker, which his, his, his son, grandson, uh, Bobby, gave me. Uh, he, were, this is, he called this the Ship and Engine Company. And indeed, if you go over there and you, and you don't get run into by somebody and you can look out, you'll see carved in the lintel of one of the older buildings, N-L-S-N-E. That was the New London Ship and Engine Company. We call it EB or the boat. And while I'm at Tony, this thing that's holding me up is, is his, which Bobby gave me. I lost the rubber tip. Della, his daughter, made him have the rubber tip, so I better keep on the rug. It's a fairly gnarly thing, right? And he used to come, hitch up to that, and he'd come right down here and look out to sea. And he began, you know, they say as you get older, you look like your dog. Well, as you get older, you also start to look like your walking stick. And he looked much like that by the end. He's probably the same age I am now. And we used to sit up on his porch. Is that house still there? We have somebody who can check that out. I want to verify everything that we can here. John, John, is that house still there? Yeah, it's the second one up, right? It still has the same porch on it. Now, across the street in Zell's front yard, there is a kind of gnarly little woods in there, and there's a foundation. There used to be a house there. In the old pictures, it's a gambrel roof. And so Tony and I would sit up there. Oh, and I have an olfactory image for you here old factory, uh, he used to smoke those parodas, not peyote, parodas. Uh, that is a, a, a small cigar. Richard Brown used to characterize it as being made by roofing tar paper and dog, whatever euphemism you want to use. It's, I was going to bring some of those tonight. We could light them up until we got told to put them out, just to get that other level of imagery in there, see. So, okay, he said, what he would do is he'd smoke those things down there about that big, and then he would crush them and put them in the bowl of his corn cob pipe. So this is essence of saliva and pure nicotine in the tar paper, you know. And he lived to be over, <laughs> almost 90. Yeah, so he's puffing away there. And we're looking across the street, and that, that it looked just as it does now. And it, you could do the same thing, too. You go up on that porch and look across the street and pretend you're Tony Pace. You need his shirt. This is his shirt, yes. Could you do the, the, the Vanna White? Try it on? Well, however you feel, Vanna White, tonight. Oh, I see the cat has been sleeping on it. Well, okay. It looked like that. It, that's, I, I think that pretty much is it. I bought it at the corner closet, you know, two dollars, yes, you can, you, and he, that, I'd look out the back and I'd see that dancing around in the clothesline, or I'd see him in it. All right, okay, so we're up on the porch, and we're looking across the street, and he says, that's where they put the booze. And they being the people, we, you know, the, the big time guy, well, the middlemen, which are called the go-through boats. And they would come across the flats here. And apparently they had two different channels. One was the Protestant channel, Jim, and the other was the Catholic channel. I don't see Father Curry here. It'd be spooky if I did, right? <laughs> uh, and, and you come in from uh, Ram Island, a quirk, quick and quirk out there, and you take a beat on there, and you can get across the flats. This, we're talking about the 20s here now, and there's a lot of eelgrass out there. And the idea was to get enough ahead of the Coast Guard so they couldn't see exactly which where you went. And the Coast Guard boats were just deep enough so they'd run aground in the middle. And then you could come into the dock, this dock right here, uh, this place right here. The dock used to be, even in my day, where the beach is now. And then the 38 hurricane came along and rearranged some things. 
so it, it's not exactly that same physical doc, but it's that same place. Uh, here's, here's a note about the socio sociology of Noank at the time. We already had the house where the rat ate the baby, right? That's a little, not high end exactly. Uh, and uh, the house that I bought was from the estate of Madeline Spink. Her father was Boone Spink. Great name, huh? Boone Spink. Cena and I were driving around in Narragansett one time. We came to the corner of Boone and Spink Street. Remember that? Yeah, so apparently he was from there. And he had been an engineering officer on the Fall River Line, on the old Fall River Line, right, which used to run from New York to Fall River. And he, he lived in the house right in the corner there. And then when he died, uh, his, his daughter, Madeline, uh, inherited it. And Mar Madeline fell on kind of hard times, which is why the birds were in the chimney. And uh, well, it was, well, everybody in, in Noank was pretty much in hard times in those days. But she was in particularly hard times, Tony told me, because her boyfriend had died. Now, here's something I'm going to call on you, for Penny, for a minute. All right, I want to verify this, all right? Yes. He died right outside that door, uh, and at around the town pump in the middle of the day. And he, he was from New York. Yeah? He was from New York. And he died out there. He was shot, bang, with a pistol. A kind of interesting little quaint village, right? Yeah, yeah. And she never recovered from that, nor did that guy. Uh, did they catch the guy? <laughs> Who knows? Who cares, right? <laughs> but that's, that's what was going on. So Tony's sitting up on the porch, and uh, usually he watched the trucks come right down to here. I was going to have you open the door, but it's raining, yes. That was where you were going to come in. To just to verify. you got to verify everything. See, uh, the, the town pump was still there in the dock and all that stuff. You can verify it on the way out if you, you know, challenge all this. Stuff. So uh, the, 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 the boats would come into the dock and they would load up these, these uh, uh, trucks and so forth that I described earlier. And off they would go to, to New York and maybe some stops along the way, however they arranged that. And uh, one day somehow the logistics were getting screwed up. I don't know if it was the trucks fault or the boats were early or what it was, but they didn't make the connection. So what do you do when you come in with a load of, of whiskey here in the middle of the day or whatever? You know, you don't leave it on the dock. You've got to hide it somewhere, right? So they hid it in the basement of the house where the rat ate the baby, right across the street. And if you look in there, even today, although I think that uh, most of those bottles were cleaned out, certainly the ones that were full, it used to be full of broken bottles. I don't think those were all had to do with the rum running days. But it, 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 there's something about that place that said, Put bottles here, right? And then, then a day later or so, they came back. And uh, what happened when they came back? Well, then they had to load the trucks, and they were doing it right in front of Tony's house. So he says to me, and this is a quote, he did not say they were speaking the language of my hometown. He did not say they were speaking Italian. He says, they're talking WAP. That's what he said. And so he took that as a good thing, and he walked across the street. And did some of that back at them. And they said, okay, this is great because here's the guy sitting on the porch. There's one of two things we're going to have to do, right? Either make friends with him or whatever, you yeah? <laughs> know? The house of the rat ate the baby. So uh, they gave him a bottle or two, you know, and they shook hands and so forth. They went back and sat on the porch. And that's how that exchange was affected there. Uh, and it shows you a lot of things, I think, about uh, attitudes and, and, and so forth, uh, what was they put up with and what, what they wouldn't. Uh, let's, let's go to uh, another Noank boat. This is the Mandalay. We haven't got to any Noank boats yet, have we? No. <laughs> Always have the president here so that she can check your facts. Okay, the Mandalay a very uh, exotic named vessel, right? On the road to Mandalay where the flying fishes play and the sun comes up like thunder out of... China, across the bay. Now, if you've been there, you know that's not true. <laughs> it, it's, he's got it all, by the old my mind, Pagoda. But that's Kipling, of course. It turned into a song that Frank Sinatra and others sang. Uh, but but uh, 
my, my next guy here, uh, uh, Jimmy Lawrence, uh, liked that. He fell in love with that name, and he named his boat that. And who was Jimmy Lawrence? Jimmy Lawrence was from uh, St. Martin's. You know, St. Martin's is an island in the Caribbean, and there's, it has two sides, St. Martin's and St. Martin's with a couple of A's. He came from the double A side. And then he ended up in New London, uh, and he sort of was... Uh, this tells us something about commercial fishermen and so forth. One of the unintended consequences of prohibition was it was the first government program to help fishermen. <laughs> and the way it helped fishermen is it gave them, as we would say today, low-hanging fruit or targets of opportunity. Uh, and I'm talking about a type of fisherman who was not a gangster by nature but was running a little bit low on fuel money or something like that and saw an opportunity to uh, here and there do stuff. A example, Larry Malloy, my, my friend who had the grounds out here, uh, he says when he was a kid over in Greenport, he went in the pantry one night and he saw all these black bottles. And uh, they didn't have, la either they didn't have labels, he wasn't old enough to read, he didn't know how to interpret what the labels were. Anyway, he, did, he was terrified at all these black bottles and he asked his father and the guy says, shut up kid, that's, those, that's prune juice. What could be more terrifying than to see your life ahead stretching out a pantry full of prune juice? It's ours. Yeah. Oh, the next day, though, guess what? It was all gone. Not drunk. You know, logistics. Greenport, exactly. Greenport. Okay. So uh, Jimmy Lawrence decides that he's going to get in on a little bit of this. He's going to do more than just, you know, come across stuff here and there. He's going to actually, so what he did is when he was designing and building the boat is he put the false bottom in. And any, any book, worthwhile book on prohibition always has a picture of one of those boats with the false bottom of the bilge. You know, you pick it up, you say, oh, that's the bilge water. But underneath it, it's all the boat. So Jimmy Lawrence did that. And he built it right down the road at the Noang shipyard. And he was a very thorough builder. He was so thorough that he was still building it when, when repeal came. <laughs> I got to know Jimmy later because I, I bought his, his next boat. I still own it. He called it the Lawrence. He already had the fancy name, the Mandalay. Now, nah, this is the last boat he's going to build. It's going to be Lawrence, right? And, you know, the name of a boat that works is the one that people call it that. People always call it the Lawrence. They don't call it the Mandalay or the something like that. So it's a good name. Now, what happened to the Mandalay? Well, if you look at pictures of the 38 hurricane aftermath, you'll see in the back of the London Railroad Station, you'll see boats scattered all over the place. The water came up in there. And the most magnificent one up there on its side is Mandalay. And you think, well, that's what happened to her. Yes, it did. But it wasn't the end of her. He got it back in the water, and he went fishing with it. And I found out what happened. Part of what I'm trying to do tonight is show you how you find out these things. See, <laughs> it isn't all by going to the New London Day and asking him what the reporter misunderstood that day of what happened. Uh, I was over at, uh, what was it, uh, John Cretero's uh, uh, pet shop in, in, in Mystic, buying something for our cats. And next to me was this fellow that looked vaguely familiar, and John introduced me. He was the head of the Noank fishing fleet insofar as they have a head. So we got talking, we got talking about Jimmy Lawrence, because I had that boat, and this guy, this guy had you know, big time stuff. He was in there buying fish food. Here's a guy who runs all these draggers. He's buying this little, you know, stuff that you put on the top of the fish. But that's what he was doing. So we got talking, and he said, yeah, I was alongside of him. Jimmy Lawrence, when the boat sank, the Mandalay. And they were off Block Island, which is a euphemism, like, like oh, Jesus, where are we? We're off Block Island, you know. But I don't see the Block Island part. Well, that's the off part, right? <laughs> and what they would do, and these are uh, otter trawl draggers, they, they, they never quite knew, even an experienced guy like Jimmy Lawrence, how much was in that otter trawl. They bring it up, because it's, it's, it's lighter in the water, and they get it up, and you, now it's too late, right? And he pulled the, the purse strings on it, and it went down on the boat. And my God, it was such a big load that the, the Mandalay started to settle down in the water and sink. You'll see pictures of this kind of thing down where you used to in, in the Harborview restaurant in the old iteration of it down there in, in, in uh, what is that town down there? Stimmington. Stimmington. You'll see it down there. You notice all the jokes people used to make about Stimmington they now make about Noank? 
the gated community thing and the elite and all that stuff. They're making those jokes about us now. Us with a rat ate the baby, you know, stuff going on. Anyway, so uh, Madeira is alongside him, and of course he, he sends a boat over and he takes the people off. It's clearly sinking the Mandalay. And they had a dog. This is a terrible story. Maybe you don't want to hear this. You know what happened to the dog. But the, the thing about it is, it's, it's, it's worse than you think because the dog actually got off the boat, swam over to the Stonington Dragger, and, they had, and then the dog said, wait a minute, I forgot something. And it went back and down went the dog and the Mandalay off Block Island, and that's what happened to the rum runner that never ran rum. That was a magnificent vessel until it wasn't, right? On the road to Mandalay. You know, speaking, speaking of singing, one of my problems with my colleagues at, at Avery Point and all this verification stuff is that they, they always called ships platforms. I had a terrible job. I finally lost out and decided I'd better retire. I could not win that one. They always would call ships platforms. I should go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea and sky, to the whale's way, and all I ask is a tall platform. <laughs> and a star to steer her by. In the Bible, here's your part, Jim. In the Bible, those that go down to the sea in platforms, right? <laughs> yes, yes. How many of you can do a Shirley Temple thing? On the good platform lollipop. Anyway, I got that off my chest. How about some other stuff? Anecdotes, okay. Walt Dean. Walt Dean. How many of you knew Walt Dean? He, you did. She does because she still has his cat. One of, yeah, Walt Dean was a wonderful fellow who lived in, uh, in various places. He, he lived to be almost 90. He, he also went to Carson's quite a bit, and uh, I got to know him pretty well. He grew up actually in the boatyard I have now as a, as a kid, and this story's about that. This is in Willow Point, and he's a little kid. His father's the uh, night watchman at the shipyard. He got that job because he was injured and couldn't do anything else, so he'd limp around. And Walt was about 10 or something like that, and he could run off to the little stations for the DTEX clock up in the corners of the boatyard, fire watch every night, and then he'd come back, and he worked with his father that way. And then he'd go to bed, and he would hear, that's my imitation of a, 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 an engine, a rum runner engine uh, from airplanes. Uh, they got these things from airplanes because they could get two or three of those things for the price. You could get a Sterling. The Coast Guard was buying Sterling engines, and the, the rum runners would buy three of those for the same price with, right out of the box with the Cosmoline still on them. Uh, the only problem was their airplane engines, and you're, you're thinking of those of you, it's, uh, is it men's engines time? Yes. 8.30 every night you got to talk about men's engines in the link. Yeah, so we're right, right around in time. Uh, you're not going to be able to cool it in, in going on the water, right? So you have to buy something, and the Vemler company, it, uh, I, don't, I do have the address somewhere if you want this, in the New Jersey would make for like $22 a, a thing to adapt the engine. Because of course an airplane engine is, is flying, you know, hundreds of miles an hour through a lot of air. Uh, and a boat is going, you know, maybe 40 or 50, these guys uh, at best, not fast enough, enough to create that air. So you put this $22 thing on there, and you can adapt it. Liberty engines, they were called, because this is the World War I, right? And we had freedom fries and all that, and, and the recent thing we had here, well, they did that with, everything was liberty this, liberty that, liberty fries instead of French fries, and, and, and you didn't have sauerkraut, because that's German. And so you had liberty cabbage, <laughs> like that. Well, so we had liberty engines, and we had a lot of extra ones because we got in that war late, and we had all these things left over. We also had a lot of extra machine guns and stuff. Those, those all went on surplus. One of the pictures of Bill McCoy we have in the uh, edition we did in Flat Hammock, uh, somebody called us up and said, you see those serial numbers on the box of, of the ammunition he has? That's the Springfield Armory. So this, this is full of all these kind of stories about, you know, who's on whose what side and so forth uh, here. So the Liberty engines, but they were very loud. They never could silence them. So there were two ways if you had a boat that you could get through. One was to have it really fast with the Liberty engine painted black and so forth. And the other to have it really slow and look like a Larry Malloy or, or uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Lawrence fishing boat, local vernacular boat. 
uh, when uh, we, we did a movie for Woody Allen called Bullets Over Broadway and we were the boat wranglers and it started off with the prohibition scene down in, in Manhattan. Whenever you work for these guys, <laughs> they know how to make a movie but they know nothing about boats even if they grew up there, you know, and you say, look, the tide is going to drop 14 feet. Why don't you shoot this now and shoot the one inside later? Oh no. So anyway, that, you will never see this scene in Bullets Over Broadway because they had to cut it because we dropped out of frame. But anyway, <laughs> so and they made us paint the boat gray and I said, look, this is a slow boat. This is the Lawrence. Uh, it's an eight knotter, if that. This is the vernacular boat. This is the boat you're used to seeing every day. You're not going to paint it gray. Why are you painting it gray? You're going to sneak something in? No, I'm just a local guy. See, that's how you do that. Annie, the same sort of thing. Or you have these Liberty Engine guys, one or the other. So Walt Dean is going to bed up there at West Mystic and he hears the Liberty Engines uh, coming in. It was some kind of funny gargling. I heard one when I was a kid up in the Connecticut River. It belonged to a guy who had a, a former rum runner and so forth. And I said, that's a funny sound. And my father says, well, he told me this whole story about the Liberty Engines and how, you know, not all of this, but some of it, uh, how they had those things. So here's a guy going to bed, and he hears those engines every night bringing stuff up to the casino. If you've been to Willow Point, you know there's a road there that says casino. That's not gambling. Well, I don't say that nobody in the back room wasn't, you know. But it, that's, it, casino, as you know, uh, it's just a word for house, casa, so forth. Uh, casino at Grot Long Point, so forth. Uh, and it was a dance hall, really. And uh, they held dances and the band would play, so Walt would hear the band playing. This is a very prohibition kind of atmosphere, thing, hearing the, the jazz band playing. And who's dancing around? Florence Fitzpatrick. Uh, some of you knew her, did you know her? Yes, yes. She lived up on, on Snake Hill in a house that's since been, did you know her? Yes. Great, see I'm not making this stuff up. These people really <laughs> existed. And Florence Fitzpatrick is a young girl. She won the dancing contest. Can you imagine that? Because when we knew her, she was not dancing that hard, right? <laughs> and so the people that owned the boatyard in, in, in my time, uh, one of them was getting married, and I bought the, the, the trophy that she won. It looked like third place Groton Long Point, you know, a weak regatta or something like that. About this big, a loving cup, and I bought it for $2, and, and my wife shined, spent the whole night shining it up, and we presented that to him, and it says, Casino, oh, Dancing, Florence, Rich Patrick, and so forth and so forth. So that's the scene that you had up there, a kind of nice, nice sort of scene. And the good news is the fellow from Canada who's bought that property now is going to rebuild that building, not as a dance hall. You'll have to find another place to dance. But uh, as a uh, boat shop, it's interesting he made all the money to do that on crime in Detroit. Now how you do that is you build cars in, or modify cars in Canada, he's from Toronto, that are fast enough to catch criminals in Detroit. You see, that's how you do that. You learn a lot of stuff from this, yeah, how to do this. And so that's how he's able to afford to do that. And that's what that project is happening up there. It's going to be a wonderful yard, and, and our uh, Andy Giblin is running it. I don't see Andy here, but you, you, a lot of you know Andy. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, uh, let's talk a little bit about Ernie Post. Ernie Post was the son of Franklin Post. And the reason why the sign out in front of the yard said, Ernest Post and Son. Yes. And uh, what they would do up there, this is the yard that's no longer there, as of two years ago, burned down, right? Yeah. Well, if you remember how that looked with all those strange buildings that were pointed in, in almost scarlet for the trim and things like that, uh, and a great big turntable there and so forth. It was a tremendously wonderful yard and enlarged. And the Post father and son ran that for years and they built boats and they built, yes, they built rum runners and they also helped the Coast Guard and built boats there. How did the Coast Guard get their boats built? Well, Curtis Bay was up and running. That's down in, in Baltimore, or as they say, Baltimore. And, uh, but they couldn't keep up with that. So a lot of local yards did build Coast Guard boats here and there, and they built one there. Now, if you think about this, you're building a Coast Guard boat here to catch the rum runner who's being built over here. So the rum runner 
goes and says, gee, that's interesting. You, know, you just did this or that. You've got the skeg a little different and so forth. And of course, the Coast Guard could never keep up with that because they're on a government contract, right? And everything's, you know. And that's why the Coast Guard never could catch these guys. Uh, because they, they always were able to, you know, steal, the, steal the, the, the secrets and so forth. One of these boats was named the Whispering Wind. And this is a, a gorgeous boat. I think it was even fire. This is sort of masquerading as a yacht. And they were so proud of it when they got it built that they, they launched, when they launched it, that the guys, the, the gangsters, as, as Woody Allen calls them, <laughs> the gangsters decided to take it for a little trip around the block. And boom, zoom, they went on down the river here and uh, around the corner and out around Raymond and Bell and down the, to Watch Hill and so forth. And this is a lot of fun. And one of them said, you know, we got guys out there, they're just off the river, like, why don't we just, you know, while, while we're at it, you know. The, this is so much fun. So they picked up a load and they came back in. But they forgot that when they came down the river, they were going by the Mystic Shipyard. And one of the things that was happening in the Mystic Shipyard is the Coast Guard had a little sub base over, not submarine, but you know, a minor kind of base. And they said, watch them go by. Said, that looks an awful lot like rum runner, right? And so they thought they, they nailed them. So those guys never made one voyage successfully. They're, they're one of the ones that end up on that side of things, the, the whispering wind. Fisher's Island uh, was a good place. Uh, well, in this case, this story actually, the boat got wrecked on the far side, and uh, a lot of stuff came washing ashore. And uh, you might ask whether boat, those, a, a case, a wooden case full of bottles full of liquid, was that going to sink or float? Uh, I don't know how your experiments have been in that. You might want to try this when the weather gets warmer and see how it works out for you. Uh, what I've found is that they sort of float for a while or something. Anyway, then they, they got into the beach anyway without getting all busted up, and the people in Fisher's Island were glad to see this stuff, and they grabbed it off the beach quickly, and then they realized they're not supposed to have this, so they, they buried it in their gardens, and they had, you know, like carrots, that would be gin, and then they would have potatoes, that would be whiskey or something like that, and they'd all go out and get some carrots there. You know, that's, that's one of the more pleasant stories about uh, the whole thing. Well, that brings us to the, uh, the, the, the black duck. There's also uh, somebody in the audience whose uncle knew the black duck because it used to park in the backyard. Are, are you here tonight, sir? No. Well, well, we'll hear, we'll hear some stories we have when I get done. Yeah. Anyway, the black duck was a, a speedboat, and it was the most famous one. You find it in even the most cursory uh, accounts of the, the, the rum running. And, uh, it uh, was running rum one up the uh, up Narragansett Bay one night, and the fellow who was uh, going to chase it or went for the Coast Guard was named Cornell, and he lived in New London in Shaw's Cove on a houseboat, which was a damn good thing. Uh, and uh, he lived there, he had a lot of kids, sort of like a little Noah's Ark. He's right in the middle of Shaw's Cove over there, which is where the Lawrence incidentally was built. And, uh, he, he decided he was going to stop the black duck. So what he did is he went to Newport and he tied off that buoy. A lot of you know that buoy because if you've ever been in Newport Harbor, that's the one you see on the right-hand side. You take the right and you go into the harbor, that one right there. He's tied up to it. You're saying, you're not supposed to tie up to a buoy. Yeah, he's a Coast Guard. So he's up there and he's waiting for the black duck to come in. Now the black duck at this time was crewed by, uh, by commercial fishermen, really, and not gangsters. These were guys that were a little more active uh, in, in, the, in the trade than, than some of the people I've been talking about here. They were, you know, more on purpose kind of stuff. And they're charging up the bay. And so Cornell says, here she comes. And instead of putting a warning shot across the bow, he put a, a bunch of machine gun bullets through the pilot house. <laughs> yes, and that's the new uh, head of the Coast Guard, Ballard, of Admiral Ballard Academy. They brought him in because all the Coast Guard people Coast Guard then used to be like the local fire department, so you knew everybody, right? And not, so they brought somebody in that was a stranger, you know, get new blood in there and so to tighten up on this thing. So, but, but even Ballard said to Cornell, you know, he says, that's not a warning shot across the bow to take, you know, machine gun and just kill everybody on the boat. Uh, they didn't kill everybody, about half of them, and that boat went veering off to the port over in those uh, funny islands that are on the left-hand side, those the, the houses way up in the air, you know, on those side. Yeah, they ran up on there. And so that's, that's how you get a boat that can, that can catch the black duck, because you catch the black duck, and now you've got a fast boat. 
And that's what they were trying to do. And the one that Walt used to hear up here, the come and go, she was not that fast, but they caught her. And you can find her listed, John, in, in, uh, in uh, Willoughby's book, right? What's his first name? He, John usually knows this stuff. Will, Will, Willoughby uh, was a, a writer for the Coast Guard who documents everything in sight. You know, he's got a wife's fly clipper over here. He's got a number on that, so forth. Anyway, Willoughby tells you about, uh, all the boats that got caught. The come and go that Walt Lincoln used to hear was one of the ones that were caught. And the, the Coast Guard was about to convert that into a rum chaser when the uh, uh, repeal came and it was uh, disposed of in another way. I don't know. Uh, okay. Now you might think, gosh, nobody seems to be getting caught here, not enough. What did they try to do this? Well, Tommy Burbine, remember Tommy? Yes, yes Tommy Burbine, we used to call him the mayor of Noank. Well, we don't have a mayor and he wasn't it, but he was better than a mayor. And he was, when he was a young man, he told me this story himself. He was in the Coast Guard and he had a job as being a beach patrol at Watch Hill. I just think of this. Here's Tommy was a very strong man, but he was only equipped with not a not a forty five. I don't think he even had a flare gun. I think he, he had a, he had a flashlight. <laughs> and he's walking along there. Here's a nineteen year old, twenty year old kid from Noack schlepping along the beach near Napa Tree Point, coming in like that, and he sees these guys coming in. Right? What does that look like? It looks like. Guys landing rum, of course, and there they are, they're carrying cases off. Now what is he supposed to do? Apprehend them, right? So I said, Tommy, what did you do? He says, well, the fortune is a couple of big rocks, I just got behind those. <laughs> and I says, okay, I can understand that. Now, I used to have that job later on uh, in the Coast Guard, uh, just looking for dead people that washed ashore, but, uh, so I could sympathize with them. I found the body there one time. I thought it was a body. I, I let it stay there for about three hours before I went up and checked it out. So it's very spooky when you're all alone on the beach like that. You're supposed to stop the rum runners or turn them, whatever. So he did not, uh, he waited until they were all gone. And then he went back up into the station. You know, the station is still there, right? Or they move it recently. They're going to move it, I think, or something. Right on the point as you go out to the lighthouse. Yeah. Uh, and I said, did you, did you, then you reported that? And he said, he says, they really didn't want to hear that. I mean, what were they, they, they would have to do something about it then. <laughs> and the Watch Hill Coast Guard had a great reputation for having the best booze. And I know that because my father told me that. He used to buy all his best booze from the Watch Hill Coast Guard when he was working as a carpenter down there. Because the, the stuff that wasn't good, they just, you know, throw it away. All you need is a bottle or two to establish the thing. You don't want to keep all that crap around. So the other stuff they did, so they had it. So that was, that was the beach patrol, uh, catching or not catching people. And that's our, our dear Tommy uh, when he was a kid doing that sort of thing. Okay, the, uh, I'm going to end up here with... Uh, uh, I think a kind of culmination story of a lot of these things. And this has to do with Pete Shandy or how many of you knew him? You, my gosh, you, yes, that's terrific. I was going to bring up, we have a sign up at the store, the same store she was talking about, says Shandy or on it, but somehow it's not there. I had uh, Andrew looking for it all day and so forth. So you'll have to imagine there was this guy named Pete Shandy or, and he had a wife. John, I never can remember her name. What was it? Doris? Doris? Lois. Why can't I remember that name? Anyway, that's an end joke. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Lois was there. And Lois was the local head of the Women's Christian, Jim, pay attention, Women's Christian Temperance Union. They're still running, aren't they? Yeah, they are, I think. If you look them up on the machine... He doesn't hang out with them. For those who don't know him, our theological uh, fact checker over here is, is the Reverend Pratt, and uh, we're checking that out now. But anyway, the Williams Christian Testament. Now, out in Block Island, there is a statue. Anybody's ever been there to the downtown? It's, it's that wonderful statue. They call her Rebecca. They think he's, she's from the Bible. Uh, and they, they wanted her to have been from the Bible, and they included the woman who was the head of the National Women's Christian <laughs> Temple Union, and uh, uh, she 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 had some money, and, and she said, "We're going to erect this statue to to uh, you know, 
to, not, they don't call it chastity, what do you call it when you don't drink? Temperance. Whatever that is, temperance, temperance, Christian temperance, right, yeah. So they're going to, uh, uh, she, she like that. Now if you look at that statue carefully, first of all, there's a little uh, uh, roving problem there because this is, she got this out of a catalog for gardens, Victorian period, Victorian gardens, you know, they're supposed to be, but you know, they got around that, didn't they? Because they had all these statues and things. Those little, you see them in Newport, the little boys, you know, and then and here's Rebecca. Rebecca actually was a Ganymede. That's a pagan thing, a, a, a gopher for, for, the, for uh, Bacchus, Dionysus, who's a Greek, yeah, uh, patron saint of wine and, and et cetera. <laughs> And uh, that's how she really is. And if you look closer, you see that there's a problem with the upper story there that they sometimes worry about, particularly in cold weather. And then uh, you also have uh, uh, what she has slung over her back, which is a sack of grapes. A grape is an innocent sort of thing, except you know what she can do with a grape? Yes. So this is a celebration. <laughs> and, uh, and that, but the women's Christian, it says that, that right underneath them, that they paid for that. Uh, and at some point, somebody must have said, hey, you know, uh, you know, or maybe they didn't. I'm sure nobody told her that. No, no. <laughs> you said, no. <laughs> and that's the statue that these guys would come by uh, when they're changing the spark plugs in the Liberty engine. I didn't tell you this in case you want to buy a Liberty engine. They, the spark plugs gum up after one trip. So you say, they're not really meant to do this sort of thing. Uh, so you have to get new spark plugs. And of course, if you're a rum runner, what you do is you change the spark plugs, which you do by unscrewing it and throwing it in Block Island Harbor. That would be good archaeology, wouldn't it? All those spark plugs down underneath there. And then you've got a whole bucket full of them, which you've carried by Rebecca to get there, you know, to change every day. Uh, okay, so uh, Pete's wife, Lois Chantier, was head of the local WCTU, and Pete was, I don't know whether Pete was enlisted in that or not. He had to, whatever you do to get along, yeah, yeah, like that. He, was, he ran the grocery store. The, what Palmer's we call it now because it was up to Palmer's shipyard. Yeah. And uh, he had customers. He also had whatever, what he didn't have the booze and this because any of that. He bananas and things like that. But he had customers. And Memorial Day was coming up. And we all know about the Memorial Day parade. <laughs> I'm kind of laughing because I have a, a connection with Lois Chandier here uh, riding in the parade last, last year. <laughs> I'm uh, thinking of her because she was had that job that I had this this last spring, and she was the one in the car and so forth. And the car she was in was Pete's car, and Pete's car was one of those that had a literal trunk stuck up on the back, like they did in the twenties or so, like that. And uh, you weren't really supposed to ride on it, but you could in a, going slow in a parade. So Lois Shandier is up there representing the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And that's, that's fine. And that parade started probably like now about 10 o'clock, right? Never mind about, it started at 10 o'clock. Now Pete had to get out to get to hit the stuff. His, and what had happened is the night before the Coast Guard was waiting out here and they couldn't get it in. But they, what they did is, what they often did is they, they knew a certain lobster when they pulled up the lobster pots and they put the stuff in the lobster pot. Get rid of the lobster if he's in there. And so he knew which one of those were. So he comes down here early in the morning, right down here, doo -doo -doo -doo, gets in his rowboat, rows out, goes to the lobster pots. The Coast Guard by then, they're out, you know, sleeping off the night watch and things like that. They think, nobody's going to smuggle that in in the middle of the day. So he loads up on that stuff and then he looks at his watch and, he's supposed to be driving that car. She's going to be sitting up on the car representing all that she represents, right? He doesn't have time to, he's got to get it in the car. And she says, it's about time. Where you been? Drive. So she gets up on the box, which is full <laughs> of this stuff. And she's going down the street. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, I was. I promised uh, uh, Ms. Watrous here that she could. Do you want to make? You don't. Want to, just tell them briefly what you did. Why don't you stand up and shoot it that way? I, I really didn't plan on it. <laughs> but um, I used to live down at the end of where the village boatyard uh, Watrous. Um, 
we grew up there, and my dad died um, when I was pretty young. But the story has it that when he was around 15 or so, he and his brother Phil, I don't know if you know the one his brother's machine shop. Yeah. That's yeah. run by my brother now, but Phil and um, Joe used to run it. But when he was very young, he used to work, um, God, and I'm creating the Lathrop machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. over yeah. Mystic. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but he used to work on the engines and uh, either build or work on the Rum Runners engines, whatever um, that was. But um, just a little story. And he used to, I remember he used to have a cocker still that we had in the, in the garage down there. But he made me remember, and this is kind of embarrassing, you know, the, the rat that ate the baby? Yes. <laughs> I remember. That was a relative of yours? No, thank God. <laughs> thank God. No, but I remember. Okay, so we had the wide floorboards down in that old house, and there would be, you know, holes in the floor. And I remember sitting watching TV when a rat would stick its head up <gasps> through the, you know, the, the floorboard. Forget about affluent knowing. Um, but, and then, you know, my brothers or father would take a piece of steel or something, I don't know, and gap around to cover up the hole. But I remember those rats. And thank God they didn't eat me. <laughs> that's a hard story to, to top. Anybody else have a... doesn't have to be about rats. <laughs> Nobody, nobody had a, a, a come on. Many of you, I'm sure, had some kind of thing where Uncle So said we used to do this or that, and told you that story, and then said, "Don't tell anybody." I, I have a question for you, though, yeah. and something I had heard, and I, I don't know. Did they have a thing going with the Rum Runners and the railroad bridge, and um, uh, making sure they could get through? They closed it and told the Coast Guard that, um, "Sorry, we can't open it right now." and let the rum runners through? That's something I ever heard. Well, I, I don't know, but I don't see why they would. I mean, I would okay. see why they would, but I don't see why they get themselves in a position where uh, they were depending on the railroad bridge to open up. Right. I think they would have offloaded before they got there because, you know, it would be something they probably couldn't depend on. Okay. And then they'd, you know, they'd have you. But, but there are a lot of stories about uh, uh, cooperation between people that should not be doing that sort of stuff. Uh, like the Coast Guard, of course, is notorious for that. See, that's why, I, I don't know if I told you or not, but, but Cornell, who, who shot the uh, Black Duck, he was a Navy guy who, would re who went to the Coast Guard. Now, the difference between the Coast Guard and the Navy, which is a lot of it, is that the Navy tended to get people from further away, you know, famously Kansas and places like that. I know some of you, where are you here? You're over here, under here. <laughs> there's Oliver over there. Uh, well, you're not from Kansas, but you're what, from, from Michigan, right? right. Yeah. Uh, whereas the Coast Guard guys were all local. Again, it was like the fire department, so it was easier to corrupt. You weren't even really corrupting them, because it was your brother or uncle that was, you know, uh, it wasn't necessary to bribe somebody or something like that. It was just a, sort of the weight of the whole thing for 13 years. You know, when Franklin Roosevelt became president in 1932, uh, he, uh, he, he, he was, had the polio thing, so he, he, uh, his son, Jimmy's uh, roommate at, at Harvard, uh, had a boat his father did called the Amberjack, a lovely, uh, y'all, I think, two-masted anyway, out of Marion. And, and so he, Roosevelt decided to celebrate the, uh, the uh, being elected president of the United States. So he went on a yachting trip on this boat. It was about, you know, 42 feet long or something like that. And he decided he would go up to Campombello for, you know, because he had the place up there. That's a pretty long hike. Uh, and, and he was going out around Provincetown, which is kind of hairy, you know, and stuff like that. But the thing that was really interesting about that is that he was escorted by a boat called Cuyahoga, which is a, what we used to call a buck and a quarter, 125 foot boat. I was one I was on myself for a while, and then it sank, and a lot of people died. And I, unfortunately, I wasn't on it then. Uh, some of its uh, uh, steering wheel and so forth is up in the academy now. But the Cuyahoga was one of the this class of boats that was designed particularly to get McCoy out on Rum Row because that was 12 miles out, and you couldn't have these little boats chasing around out there, you know. 
So they, they, this boat was designed exactly for that. And Roosevelt knew all that kind of stuff. So there, the Cuyahoga is, is escorting the Amberjack, and what Roosevelt decided to do was to play hide and seek. He pretended he was a rum runner, and he would try to hide from them as they went out around Cape Cod and so forth. Uh, which he succeeded in doing, losing him for a whole day. He thought that was just great. You know, his, <laughs> that shows you the attitude about the whole thing. And then when they went to international waters, they had to get even bigger vessels, so they got the Annapolis, Indianapolis. And those of you that know something about World War II and about the atomic bomb and uh, have seen Jaws and so forth, that story that Quint tells, hey, we're down in the water, you know, and the sharks come in. That story, that's the Indianapolis. Uh, and this was uh, escorting Roosevelt, so he had two interesting uh, vessels, both of which sank tra tragically to get him up to Campanbello. Uh, but again, you know, the, 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 the woman I should throw in here that actually was most effective against prohibition was a woman named Mabel Willebrand. And they, they put her there because they figured, she's a woman, she won't be able to do anything, see? And she, she did things, and she got people arrested, so we were like, she was on the cover of Time magazine even. She was so good at that. And later she became uh, a press agent for Amelia Earhart. Look at the plaque on the front door. Amelia was here, right? Yeah. All these funny connections, yeah. And any more questions? Or young? How long do we have the room? <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah, okay. thank you, Steve. Okay. Uh,